So today I'm going to talk about a news article that I read on ScienceDaily.com, uh, which is a website I use quite often just for keeping up on science news. But anyway, I read an article last week that said, junk food makes rats lose appetite for a balanced diet. And guys, just as an aside, whenever I'm reading something online that reports new findings in science, the first thing I always do is scroll down to the bottom of the article and look at their references list. And if there is no reference list, then I just stop reading, unless, unless it's something by uh, an author that I really trust, or if it's clearly just a blog opinion piece or something like that. But in this case, uh, they did cite the study that they were referencing, and so Throughout the rest of this video, I will be speaking about that study itself, uh, the original paper by Reichelt et al., and I'll put a link to both the news article and the actual paper in the description box below. So the most interesting finding of the present study was the impairment in the expression of sensory-specific satiety in rats fed a cafeteria diet. So throughout this video, I will explain what all of that stuff means, but first let me explain what it was that the research actually did in their experiment, and then I'll get to their conclusions, what it all means, and what the implications to us are. So I will have to oversimplify the experiment in this video just for the sake of time, but I do encourage you to go out and read the full text for yourself uh, if you have access to it. They took one group of rats and fed them a healthy diet of what's called rat chow. And then they took another group of rats and they gave them the same healthy diet of rat chow, but they added in cookies, cake, and pie, and some other stuff. And then they called the latter group the cafeteria diet group. And now, within this study, there's a lot of psychological jargon and their procedure is littered with talk of Pavlovian conditioning, outcome devaluation, and all sorts of other stuff that I'm not going to get into this video, again, for the sake of time. But essentially what happened was the rats on the healthy diet stopped responding to cues that were linked to a food they had already eaten to satiety. So in other words, once they had already eaten enough cherry-flavored Kool-Aid, which was actually what they gave the rats, so that they felt full, they no longer wanted any more cherry-flavored Kool-Aid. And then this is referred to as sensory-specific satiety. And now conversely, they found that after eating the cafeteria diet for two weeks, those rats kept on responding to cues linked to a food that they had already eaten to satiety. Or in other words, even after they ate enough cherry Kool-Aid until they felt full, they still wanted to go back for more later. And again, this is an oversimplification, but I do think it adequately captures the major finding of their experiment. So how can we interpret these results? Well, first of all, why do we have sensory-specific satiety to begin with? Why is it that after we eat a meal of chicken, rice, and vegetables, we would rather have a piece of pie than eat that same meal all over again. Well, evolutionarily, it makes a lot of sense. By having this sensory-specific satiety where we get bored to certain foods, we're encouraged to eat a wide variety of foods in the diet. And then in this way, it puts us at, it puts us at a decreased risk of developing nutrient deficiencies. So this is good, but then on the flip side of this is that if animals are given a wide variety of foods in their diet, then they're more likely to overeat and gain weight. So the question is, is this true of us humans? So there doesn't seem to be a clear picture of this whole situation. 
Some people will argue that unlike rats who are simply forming stimulus response associations leading to habit formation, us humans, we have desires and beliefs and values, and these things seem to be the primary driver behind our behaviors. And rats just simply don't have these things. But rather than cite all of the research at large, I will suffice it to cite a statement in a very well-researched lit review by a grad student at King's College, where he said, in the 1980s, a clear, clear behavioral evidence emerged that rats' actions can be controlled by states analogous to human behaviors, or sorry, human desires, beliefs, as well as by habits. Okay, so if we grant that this rat study can be applied to complex human feeding behaviors, where do we go from there? While we are certainly nowhere near having a full, clear picture of all the mechanisms involved in the psychology of human eating, based on the results of this study, if sensory-specific satiety is impaired by a diet high in junk food, it might be a good idea to keep junk foods in the cupboard to a minimum. We all know that Pop-Tarts come in packets of two, and I doubt that I'm the only one who has fit the first Pop-Tart into my macros and then gone back for the second one, even though I wasn't even that hungry anymore. And this is a perfect example of the inhibition of sensory-specific satiety that you see in a diet high in junk food. Now, the author of the study drew a similar comparison herself. She said, it's like you've just had ice cream for lunch, and yet you still go and eat more when you hear the ice cream van come by. Now, before we jump the gun and decide that all junk food is bad and it should be eradicated from every diet for every person, I would just like to remind everyone that there is not a single shred of scientific evidence to suggest that there are foods that can cause fat gain above and beyond the simple excess of calories that they provide. And that fat loss or fat gain really truly is a matter of calories in versus calories out. And the fact that junk food may inhibit sensory specific satiety leading to overfeeding is simply just changing one side of this equilibrium. It's causing more calories to go in. And I'll finish this video by reminding people of a 2002 study which showed that people who were very rigid with their dietary approach not only tended to have really crappy mood disturbances, as anyone who's ever been on a chicken and broccoli diet can certainly attest to, but they were also more likely to be heavier, to have higher body weights, and to show increased symptoms of eating disorders. And I'll also direct you guys to another study that was published in 2011 that concluded rigid dietary control strategies were inversely related to dieting success, while flexible control strategies were positively associated with dieting success. So in other words, if you're too strict and rigid with your food choices, you won't be as successful or you'll be less likely to be successful than if you allow for some flexibility in your diet. And based on my personal experience in the field and what seems to be mounting animal models about reward-seeking behavior, I think that an emphasis on a wide variety of foods with a 10 to 20% limit on so-called junk foods is the best advice for anyone whose goal is fat loss. And my practical recommendations based on my own experience is to keep junk food in the house to a minimum rather than eliminating it completely. And when you do buy it, try to stick to foods that offer single serving sizes so you aren't tempted to go back for more later. For example, buy the Mr. Crispy the Mr. Christie 100 calorie single packet servings of chocolate pretzels rather than load up on a big bag of chocolate pretzels from Bulk Burn. All right guys, if you learned anything in this video, please don't forget to like the video. And if you have anything that you'd like to add to the conversation, please feel free to comment or post links below. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. All right, thank you for watching.